great character in the Bible. Uh, we can learn lots from him. Uh, so I'm excited about uh, starting that sermon series. And today we are going to have Mike that's going to be uh, bringing that sermon to us. And if you can, we would love for you to participate by interacting with us. Um, and you can do that through our Facebook platform. So get on Facebook. You can comment during the uh, the sermon and um, hopefully, you know, we'll get some interaction back with you and we'll be able to talk to you that way. And then the other ways that you can be um, participating and watching the uh, the sermons is through our other platforms. So you can go through our website and go on there and you can watch the live stream in that way. And then you can also go on YouTube. And you, if you miss a one of the these sermons, you can go back and rewatch that. So that's a great thing about YouTube doing it that way. And um, for right now, if you can take a moment, write, um, text the word check in, and you're going to do that to 610-286-5153. That um, will help us know that you're watching will help us to be able to stay connected to you. So if you're brand new and you this is your first time um, watching today, thank you for watching and joining us and welcome. And just take that time and we will send you a link that will let you be able to um, create an online profile. And then if you've been watching for however long we've been doing this, because I've lost count, you can um, also text check in and that will take you the, uh, also to the same link and you can update your profile because that allows us to stay connected to you. If we're missing an email or we have a wrong address, it, right now it's just hard for us to stay in contact with you and we wanna make sure that you are um, aware of everything that's going on and the best way to do that is to have the correct information. So um, the, another thing coming up is the chicken barbecue and I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Uh, another thing, looking for help. If you need anything, please take the time Text the word CARE, C-A-R-E, to that same number, 610-286-5153, and that will help us um, know that you need something and we will uh, be able to help you with those needs. But if you're looking to help, say maybe um, you are just tired of sitting in your lazy boy chair and you wanna get out of your house, just text, um, actually no, you're not gonna text, you're gonna email, you're gonna email matt at matt at mcchurch.me that's matt at mcchurch.me, and I don't know why I repeated that, because I bet you Dan has it over the screen somewhere for you to see. So, matt at mcchurch.me, and um, that will allow us to know you wanna help out. So if you are a younger viewer, let me start off by saying I miss you terribly, um, and I, I really do. I know all of us other teachers in the Growth, um, growth Kids Ministry miss you terribly as well. But did you know that you don't have to just watch this service online? There are other ways for you to be able to view um, lessons on your level. So on Wednesdays and on Sundays, we will email you, again, why it's such an important thing to make sure that we have your right email address. We will email you lessons that are um, created for you. So Wednesdays and Sundays, we send those emails out and you'll be able to do that. And also I believe they are out on YouTube as well. So you can watch them there. And then um, for us adults, uh, we have our Zoom calls on Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. If you're early bird um, and you're not sleeping in right now and you wanna enjoy us for that, we would love to have you hop in on those Zoom calls. We are reading through the Bible in a year. So that's, um, I think we are in Samuel right now. So uh, hop in there anytime. And uh, we would love to see you 6.30 in the morning. And that's uh, usually then till seven. If you uh, want to hop in on Monday nights, we are doing a, a book study through the book of Daniel, and that's led by Dennis and Tina Carroll. That's going to be at 6.30 p.m. And then on Tuesdays for our men, we have a men's uh, Zoom call at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. That's different than all the other ones. 6 p.m. That is with Jim Caffarelli, and they are doing the book Play the Man. Great book. Um, got to over listen to uh, my husband listening in on that call and it sounds like it's an incredible series for you men. So uh, maybe hop on that one. And if you are a lady that's looking for uh, a way to connect, 6.30 p.m. on Thursdays. That's gonna be with Amy Simon and you guys are doing Resolution for Women. That's with Amy Simon on Thursdays, 6.30 p.m. And da da da, I know you're all waiting for that chicken barbecue because that's so important right now. We all love food, right? So chicken barbecue. That is going to be a drive through style chicken barbecue on May 23rd, Saturday, May 23rd, from 10.30 till 3, or whenever we run out of chicken. And now, uh, wrapping up your 5 before 
please get your hearts ready and prepared for our worship. All right, we are live at MCC Morgantown Community Church, Elverson, PA. Thanks for joining us this morning. Can we all sing it together this morning? Are you ready? On three, four, one, two, three, four. Good morning, church. Comment on Facebook if you're on there. And if you're on YouTube, you can do whatever you need to do. But uh, we're glad you're with us this morning. God bless you. Anytime somebody 
Father, we just thank you so much that the power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave is living within us, Father. We thank you, God, that your power is greater and stronger than anything that we face on earth, than anyone that we come against here on earth, Lord God. And we thank you, Father, that most important of all, you are more powerful than the enemy and you have given us victory over the enemy. Father, I just pray that you would teach us, show us how to stand in that victory that is ours, to stand in the power that is within us, Lord God. We thank you. Father, we praise you. Father, we worship you. Thank you, Jesus.
this morning. I thank that you still enable us, give us the wisdom, this technology that we can still be together. And this song kind of says it. You know, we're going to sing in the middle of this storm. This storm like no other. This storm that no one expected. That we will rise above it through you, Lord. We know you're hearing our praises. We are so confident in that. We are so confident that you are here with us. Your spirit just fills this room and your spirit just fills everyone's home. As we all long to be together again in this building, we as a worship team are missing our brothers and sisters here. Father, we just know that you're going to just take care of all this. Father, would you bless Mike's sermon this morning as he teaches us your ways, as he teaches us how you would have us live our lives and just another one of the ways as we learn every Sunday morning as we listen I pray this morning that you just keep us together as a church family and as this is going on that more people around us are joining in see what all this joyful worship is about and why we still stick together and still spread the news of Jesus Christ. Father, we are so blessed to be able to do that. We thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are so glad that you are here. Um, whether it's not in person, we're just thankful that you are watching this morning. And as we can let us know that you are watching this morning, would you take the moment to text the word check-in, that's all together, C-H-E-C-K-I-N, to 610-286-5153. And that just lets us know that you're here with us um, in spirit. So uh, the other thing, if you could, if you are in need of anything, text the word CARE, C-A-R-E, that same number, 610-286-5153. Um, that lets us know that you need something, we would be, do our best to meet your needs. And then if you are wanting to help in any way, um, you can email matt at matt at mcchurch.me, and that lets us know that you want to help out and um, reach people that way. Uh, we have an exciting event coming up this Saturday, May 23rd. We are going to do a drive through chicken barbecue. I think it's going to be a fun event um, that's going to be from 10.30 to 3 or until we are sold out of chickens. So um, again, this Saturday, May 23rd, from 10.30 to 3. And if you think that is exciting, we have something even more exciting coming up at the end of the service. So stay tuned to the very end. Thank you. So good morning and welcome out this morning. Um, do not try and adjust your horizontal or the vertical. We control them all. So. You guys probably don't know about that, but we'll go on with that. But you're probably wondering why you're seeing me up here and not Bill. Don't worry, he's fine. I know that when I came up here in the middle of everything that's going on right now, I was a little concerned that people might think that something happened. He's fine. I'm actually looking at him right now. He's doing well. So if everybody could take a moment and type amen in the chat to that, because I know if I had my phone on me, I'd be typing it right now. I'm thankful that he's doing fine. So good morning, Matt. Um, thank you for coming out, even though you're not here. 
but that's cool. Um, morning, Robin and Ron. I'm glad to see you guys are on this morning. So thanks. Um, so welcome out. Today we start a new series. We're going to be kicking off the series in the book of Joshua entitled In Your Corner. Now, throughout the course of this series, we're going to be diving into the book and kind of just bringing out every little detail that we can find about it. Now, the book of Joshua was written by about 98% of it was written by Joshua. So the other 2%, I mean, unfortunately, he can't write about his own death. So that must be left for someone else. So this week, we're going to be talking about the transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua. And then we'll get into the Israelites actually finally getting into the promised land. But in the upcoming weeks, we're going to be discussing the times when um, Rahab was present as well as the walls of Jericho and the sun standing still. Now, every one of these is a, a fundamental story that is in the book of Joshua. But moreover than anything else, the one common thread that follows this whole story that goes through the whole entire book is that every person that is involved, whether it's Joshua or Rahab, if they trusted in what God tells them and what God is doing in their life, he remains faithful to them. So essentially, and in a nutshell, that is God is in their corner. Now, I know for a lot of you, um, maybe not, but I know for me, when I hear the phrase in your corner, my mind automatically goes to boxing. And when I think of that as a product of the 70s and 80s, when boxing movies were the biggest thing coming out right now, I mean, we had all the Rocky movies, we had how many of them, Raging Bull, they were a big thing then. So for me, it's kind of like a guilty pleasure when I have the opportunity to actually be able to watch them. And maybe for some of you, it could be the same thing. But I know for me, it's, it's part of it's the story. You know, you have the underdog that had a hard life that came up through the ranks, you know, that had to fight some of his toughest opponents, some of which were even himself, until he gets to the top and he perseveres and... In most cases, in some cases, he becomes the champ. So I want to take a second for you guys, and I want to take a moment for you guys to text in the chat. I w I'm interested to find out what your favorite boxing movie is. So, and while you guys are doing that, okay, first off, though, I mean, you cannot type in Nacho Libre. That is not a boxing movie. And you know who I'm talking to. I was waiting to see you on the first service, but you know who I'm talking to. But, I mean, I know mine is Rocky. So while I'm doing this, you guys type in your favorite boxing movie. I'm going to give you guys some tips that I found out from some of the greatest boxing legends of all times. Now, you might be even saying, you're like, why in the world is he giving me tips? There's no way that I'm going to become a boxer. I'm not either. I am not becoming a boxer anytime soon. Or you might be thinking to yourself that since quarantine, that, um, you know, I could use every tip that I can get because ever since then, my wife and I have been kind of going toe to toe and I could get every little bit of advantage on her that I can. So with that being said, I'm going to bring you the first tip and that is believe in yourself. Muhammad Ali gave this tip and he said, believe in yourself. And if you're even vaguely familiar with who Muhammad Ali or how he acts or how he is, he has no problem telling you that he is the greatest of all time. Even before he was the greatest, he said that. And that was mainly because in his mind and his thoughts, which makes a lot of sense, is that if you continue to tell yourself or reaffirm yourself how, of the positives, that eventually over time you will actually start believing them and that you will start realizing and thinking that they are true. Next up comes from Lennox Lewis. His tip was to train harder. He said, make a conscious decision to push yourself to the limit every single time you're training. And then up next, Mike Tyson. He says, maintain eye contact. He says, do this with either your opponent or even your teammates to reveal your personal strength. If you want to appear confident and at the top of your game, good, long-lasting eye contact is essential. Now, Floyd Mayweather, some of you may know who he is, his tip was to be tactical and strategic. He said, a good strategy is the final step in defeating your opponent. And lastly comes from Vladimir Klitschko. And he says, have a great trainer. 
And according to him, having a great trainer can make all the difference. Not only would he be able to help you reach your goal, but he is also able to push you to your limits and see what you are capable of doing. Now, the interesting thing I found about all these tips is that not one of them had to do with the physical side of boxing. Now, I know when I started opening it up and I was reading it, I was like, okay, I'm going to find out about footwork, agility, speed, but not one of those came across. In fact, as opposed to dealing with the physical side of things, it dealt more with the psychological side of things. But the one that stuck out to me the most was the last one, and that one was from Vladimir Klitschko. And he said, have a good trainer. But what was really different about this, and it made it stick out to me from the rest, is that it was not based on personal performance. It was based more on the fact of someone else saying and what they're doing that influences the person that they're saying it to. It's like the, rat, the trainer is speaking into that boxer to build him up, and it's no longer the boxer, it's the commitment between two people that is making it that much more special. So with that, this is where you have to ask yourself, who is in your corner? Who is there to help you through the things in life when it drags you down? You know, where you have to step into that ring of life? Who's there to get you back up again? Is it a spouse? Is it a parent? When you're faced with depression or anxiety, who is there that's going to help you when everything's falling apart? Could it be a brother, a sister, maybe even a best friend? That person's not there. You know, that person that you trusted, that person that, got, that was been there through, with you through thick and thin, what do you do then? What do you do when life has you on the ropes and you, and you have to ask yourself, who is in your corner then? When you look back and you see no one physically there, who can you count on? Who is going to be there to pick you up off the mat? And who's going to get you before you're forced to throw in the towel? Now, this makes me think of how, uh, since we're in the book of Joshua, this makes me think of the story between him and Moses. Now, Joshua had probably one of the best trainers throughout the entire Bible. And when Moses dies, Joshua has to ask himself that same question. Who is going to be there? You figure Joshua followed Moses throughout the desert for 40 years. If that's not on the job training, I don't know what is. Joshua got to hear and to see all the amazing things that Moses was able to do. But not only that, but Joshua was there throughout all the things that he got to experience with Moses. I mean, he, Joshua was there when Moses freed the slaves from Egypt. Joshua got to see Moses part the Red Sea. He was there on the mountainside when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments and was able to show them to everyone. But there was also another time when they were in the wilderness or the desert and the Israelites were getting grumpy because they were, getting, they were probably getting hangry because they were having no food, no water. So they were getting a little upset and they were taking it out on Moses. Well, Moses went up and spoke to God and God told him, go speak to a rock and it will gush water. And when he did that, he came down and he called all the Israelites over and he told them to come here and see what I'm about to do. But instead of speaking to the rock, Moses struck the rock twice. Water came out. The Israelites were happy. They were thrilled. Moses got the credit. But unfortunately, he didn't give the credit back to God. And then there was another time when God told him, go into the land where I'm about to give you. Send 12 spies in there to scout it out and have them come back with a report. And when they did that, 10 of them came back with a negative report, whereas two came back with a good one that favored what God's choice was. But instead of trusting the two and God, Moses chose to, choose, chose to trust the ten. And then he wound up wandering the desert with a thousand or so Israelites in tow for 40 years. Now, talking about this kind of reminds me of a time 
years ago when I was talking to a friend of mine. Now, this guy here, we used to talk about different things that were related to the Bible. And there was a lot of times that we would come up with different topics of conversation. Like, you know, we kind of had a debate as to who actually was the author of Hebrews. He said, Paul, I said no. But anyway, he came to me with a question, and he said to me, he goes, other than Jesus Christ, who do you think suffered the most in the Bible? Right away, my first thoughts go, well, maybe a prophet, or maybe it was John the Baptist. But the more I thought about it, I was like, no, nah, it had to be Paul. Paul, I mean, I mean, he was stoned, left for dead, bitten by a snake, shipwrecked. He was in jail more than he wasn't. It had to be him. And this guy said, no. Try somebody else. And, well, maybe it was Job. Maybe Job was the one who suffered. I mean, he lost all, his entire family an entire day, lost all his belongings, his livestock, his home. And he's like, no. Does you ever think that Moses might be the one who suffered the most in the Bible? I mean, after all, he had to have the Israelites with him for 40 years, hearing all the grumbling and all the arguing. And then it made me realize that, yeah, he was probably the one who suffered the most. But, and he made a great point that Moses suffered. But Moses also did a lot of great things. But it's actually, God did a lot of great things through Moses. You see, God was the trainer to Moses. God instructed all those things to happen that Moses was able to do. So, as, and Joshua got to see all these things. It was like Joshua was a little kid sitting ringside that got to see his dad get ready for a fight. So when it came time for Joshua to pick up the reins and actually lead, Joshua would see how much God favored Moses. But you also hope that Joshua would be willing to trust a little bit more or learn from the mistakes that Moses made. So after Moses had died, Joshua, he might have needed a little push. So with any good trainer, God gave Joshua a little push, which brings us to the first point, which is God is a motivator. After the death of Moses, the time came for Joshua to pick up the banner for God. You know, God came to him 30 days after Moses' death, which was the typical mourning period for that time. And he gave Joshua these words. And he said, Moses, my servant is dead. Joshua's probably like, yeah, okay, I know that. I was there when Moses died. I was the one who probably kind of gave him that little nudge just to make sure that he had passed. But needless to say, I was there. I know that he did. Why are you telling me this? But it wasn't that simple. In not so many words, God, what God was trying to really tell him was that, okay, Moses is dead. Your turn. It's time for you to get up, put on your big boy britches, and to lead. Okay, so he wanted you to get up, get in the ring, and lead his people. Moses is gone. You're up. So, in 1939, England declared war on Germany. At this point, Germany invaded Poland, which violated the peace agreement of all Europe. Prime Minister... Prime Minister, sorry. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain led Britain for the next eight months. But in that time, he found himself ill-equipped for the daunting task of saving Europe from Nazi attacks. So on May 10th, Neville Chamberlain resigned as Prime Minister. Winston Churchill, who was known for his military leadership ability, was appointed British Prime Minister in his place. And on May 13th, in his first speech before the House of Commons, Prime Minister Churchill declared that I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. In the first year of his administration, Britain stood alone against Nazi Germany, but Churchill promised his country that and the world that Britain and their people would never surrender, and they never did. Britain discovered a new leader that would take them through the trenches in Churchill, just as God had a new leader in Joshua that he would do the same for the people of Israel. Same God, new leader. But imagine for a second the thoughts and the fears that may have crept into the mind of Joshua at that point. He followed Moses for 40 years, as I've been saying. Moses had to have been like a father to Joshua. Joshua. Although Joshua knew what would come 
after Moses' death. He was commissioned to lead in Numbers 27 and Deuteronomy 31. But things change when a person that you look up to and that you admire for so long is no longer in front of you. And the person you have to replace has done so much for so many people that's just a big set of shoes to fill. God offered a challenge to Joshua just as he challenges us. Remember, you need to have a good trainer that is going to push you to your breaking point. He's going to push you until you cannot take any more. And you have to trust him with everything you have. And this comes through in verses, the second half of verse 2 and through 3. And it says, Now then, you and all the people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Now, when I read that, my mind automatically goes, since, you know, by being a father, and I brought my son Cash up here, he's going to help me with this. When I hear that now then part, my mind automatically goes to like that father-son meet up, and he's like, he wants to try and talk with him and say, and make his point, and he's going to have his hand on his shoulder. He's not going to squeeze it too tight, but just firmly enough that you know that his presence is there. And it's like God being the father and Joshua being that son and God speaking to him saying, you see all those people out there? Those are all my people. And you see, I made a promise to their fathers and their fathers before them that I would give them that land across the Jordan River and you're going to be the one that takes them to it. You and those people are going to cross that river and take that land. Thank you. Thank you, bud. The only problem with that, though, is that the Jordan River was at flood stage that t- at that time of year, which meant that it was going to be a little tricky to cross. But just as God made that promise, you have to ask yourself, have you ever made a promise? I think that's pretty common. Pretty much most of us have. But, <laughs> but think about it when you uh, make that promise, the first promise that you ever make to somebody that you've never met or maybe that you've never made a promise to before. Think of the relief on your shoulders when you actually fulfill that promise. But on the other side of that, imagine that sense of trust, that reliability that you just put onto that person that you showed them that you owned up to that trust. Now, if you've ever held every one of your promises, type me in the chat. I'd be interested to see whoever, you know, has held every one of their promises. But on the other side of that, how many of us have ever broken a promise? A broken promise is one of those things that is never a fortunate thing to have happen. But think of the person that you broke that promise with. Now, that that person probably might look at you slightly differently now and It's probably because, you know, they expected you to do something that you didn't hold true to. And in doing so, that person might look at you a little funny, and it'll probably be a long time before they ever ask you to do something for them again. And the reason for that is that's because a promise is something special. A promise is a commitment. It brings expectation. God wanted to fill that expectation that he made with the forefathers of the Israelites so many years ago. But then God doesn't stop there. He makes a promise to Joshua. And in verse 5, this is his promise that he gives him. It says, No one will ever be able to stand up against you in all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How awesome is that to have that promise to say that God is telling him that I will be with you as I was with Moses. Joshua saw everything that God was able to do through Moses, and now he gets that ability. That's like a little kid in a candy store. He's probably so excited. But it's one of those things that I know I would be excited. But at the end of it, saying that I will never leave you or forsake you. Basically, God is telling Joshua, if you accept my challenge, I will commit myself to you. God fulfills his promises. Sometimes we may not see that come to fulfillment, but we know that if he says it, he will get it done, and he will do it. 
which brings us to Hebrews. Now, the author of Hebrews says this in chapter 10, verse 23. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. That hope is in Christ and in God. For he who promised is faithful. God does not fall on his promises. If he makes it, he's going to do it. He will see it through. Now, on the other side, I think God doesn't stop with the promise. And with any good trainer, not only does he give Joshua, he th- not only does he tell Joshua what to do, God tells him how to do it. He gives Joshua the action plan that he needs to accomplish God's plan to get into the promised land. So it brings us to the next point. Ch- point two, God has an action plan. You cannot plan to do something without an idea to get it accomplished. Okay, you've heard the phrase, a failure to plan is a plan to fail. It's still a plan. It's a plan to not do anything, okay? But on the other side, if you go into a project without having an idea of what you're going to do and how you're going to get it done, and then you surround yourself by the wrong people, that plan, that's going to go south real quick, and it's not going to do anything. Just think of how Moses, how he reacted when the 12 spies came back from the land. He, he trusted the 10 and not the 2. And kind of, you see how that worked out for him. Now, you see, I remember taking leadership classes, and in the textbook, it said, when you're going into a project, you want to start with the end in mind, which at that time was kind of like, what? That sounds kind of weird. You don't know what the end's going to look like. But in your mind, you really do know what the end looks like. So you start with that end, and then you work backwards to square one. But by doing that, you're able to have the end project and deconstruct it as you go so that you'll see the things, likely you'll see the things that you normally wouldn't have seen going from square one up. Well, this is what God does with Joshua. He gives him the plan. I know it's really, and it's really a hard one, and it's very intricate, so you're going to have to bear with me on this one. And if you're from Exeter, you might have a little trouble with this, I, I can't mess with Glenmore or Honeybrook or Elverson. I, I got to go with what I know, and that's Exeter because that's where I'm from. So I'm sorry, Exeter, but I know better. So if you're ready for it, I'm going to give it to you. You, you. you ready? Okay, here it comes. Trust God, read his word, and do what it says. And it, I, it sounds hard. It's trust God, read his word, and do what it says, and he will be with you. In verses 6 through 9 of First jo- Joshua, God tells Joshua three times, be strong and courageous, and twice he tells him to read my word and do what it says and to not turn from it. He emphasizes this, but if you really want one verse that's going to sum up all three of them, it's Joshua 1, 7, and it says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Now, it sounds pretty cut and dry, and it's one of those things that it's easier said than done. So, and when he says, be strong and courageous, what God is saying here is that he wants our confidence in him. Remember, he emphasizes it three times, be strong and courageous. And he would later say, in James 1.22, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't just take it as if it's words on a page. Do what they're telling you to do. If we all trust it in what I've just said or what you have heard, we will be much better mind state and we will be comforted by God's word. Now, I'm not condemning anyone or pointing fingers at anybody because I'm included in this because I'm just as guilty of this as anybody. But we can always take comfort in knowing the, the type of trainer that God is because he will not leave us. He doesn't give up on us, and we know that he is with us, and on top of it, he goes before us, which gives us to point three. He, or God, goes before us. Now, you have to ask, I have to ask you, have you ever been in a situation where you felt overwhelmed? You know, the odds are stacked up against you. The chips are up against you. You're in your corner. What happens then? I mean, would you feel better if I said that, you know, your odds that were against you were about 1,000 to 1? 
how would those odds feel? I know to me they would be pretty hard and pretty high. But those are the odds that were against the USA team, US, yeah, the 1980 USA hockey team, when they had to face the Soviet Union. Now, in that match, these were a bunch of ragtag college students that the average age was 21 years old. But in that time, they were going up against a well-oiled, efficient machine in the Soviet team that also had the top-ranked goalie in the Olympics that year. And on top of it, they won the gold medal the last five years and were favored to win it that year. But as we may know, the Team USA won that game that year and then went on to win the next two to achieve the gold medal. But that game against the Soviets was referred to as the miracle on ice. A miracle because that game was not supposed to be won by Team USA. And these are the type of feelings I'm sure that the Israelites were feeling as they approached the Jordan River. They probably felt as though the chips were against them, the odds were against them, they were a thousand to one that they would get across that river. Because what they were seeing was that since it was at flood stage that time of year, that river, which meant that river was 100 feet wide and about 10 feet deep. And then because of the flow of the water, it was very aggressive. But in order to get in that promised land that God promised them, they had to cross it. And God told them that they needed to trust in him to do it. So they knew that they had to. All too often, we look at a problem and say it's too great for us. And it probably is. Because we can't do great things on our own. When your problem is a 100 foot by a 10 foot river that has flown turbulently past you, as you're standing on the riverbank looking at the land that you're supposed to receive, the only thing you can do is trust God. Trust that he knows what he is doing. And just as God is a motivator, and he had a plan this time, it is for, his, for him to go before the Israelites in that land and before the Israelites into that water. And if you turn to... Chapter 3, verse 8 of Joshua, he says this. He says, Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now, I don't know about you, but didn't we just talk about that the river was 100 foot wide, 10 foot deep, flowing very fast past them, and that for them to be carrying an ark on their shoulders to walk into the water? I know if I was one of those priests, I'd probably get into that river's edge and be like, what? I can't. Uh -uh. I'm not going to be able to do it. But at the end of the day, they did. Let's jump down to verse 15. Okay. So it says, Now the Jordan is at flood stage, all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream, upstream, sorry, not steam, stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at the town of Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now, you may be saying, hold up, you said that God's going to go before them. And nowhere in there did, did it say God went before the Israelites. But it actually did. God said, told the priest to step into the water, to go before Israel. The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God going before them. He told the priest to step into the river. And when that happened, the water stopped. The Israelites were able to go through on dry ground. Through it all, God was there, and he went before them just as he said he would do. Now, sometimes when we're going through situations, he gives us something to show us that he is there alongside of us. So we remember him and all his goodness, which brings us to the next point, and that is God gives us monuments. Now, many of us have been to Washington, D.C., and if you have been there, you may have noticed that there's like monuments and memorials upon monuments and memorials. They're like on every street corner, I swear. But 
needless to say, they're there for a reason. And in that town, it's awesome to see so many and so much history. When one of the first ones that you always think of is the Washington Memorial. Now, the Washington Memorial is there to memorialize George Washington as being the first commander in chief of the United States. Next up, you have the Lincoln Memorial. That there is to honor Abraham Lincoln and throughout his presidencies and all the presidencies and all the things that he did. Next up, you have Jefferson Memorial. Jefferson Memorial is there to honor the founding fathers of this country as well as to memorialize Jefferson as the principal writer of the Declaration of Independence. Now you also have Arlington Cemetery. Arlington Cemetery is 624 acres that hold 400,000 plus bodies of U.S. soldiers that have died in service since the Civil War. And then you also have the Vietnam Memorial. This is to honor the service of those who died and or were unaccounted for during that war and may have never returned home. In fact, there are about 24 different memorials that go throughout all of D.C., but every one of them is there for different reasons as we went through them. But there's one thing that every one of them has in common, and that is they are there for, for a specific reason, and that is to, for us to remember a time and place in history, but also it is there for our future generations to be able to look back on and say, that happened then. God did the same thing for the Israelites. He gave them a memorial to remember the day that they were able to cross the Jordan River on dry ground. And that is what he did. And in verse, chapter 4, verse 4 through 7, it says, So Joshua called together the 12 men, and he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. And he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle. Okay, he said, You're a God. He kind of made it a little personal there. Into the middle of the Jordan, each of you is to take up a stone on your shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, 12 of them, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the water, the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. Those stones are there to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. God gave them a memorial for that day, the day that he stopped the water from flowing so the Israelites could cross on dry ground. He did this so that all of people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. I mean, it's crazy to think that the Israelites took stones from the middle of the Jordan River, the middle of the very thing that blocked them from getting into the promised land the land that God promised Moses 40 years earlier, the middle of the very thing that would have stopped them if they did not have the faith in the fact that God would see them through everything. God said he would get them through all they, and all they needed to do was trust and obey him. God said it to them, God said it to Joshua, and he delivered on his promise. God's saying is his doing. If God says it, he will get it done. Now, you might be feeling as if God has been challenging you in your life. Or worse yet, you might feel as though he's not even there. Now, there are a lot of times in our lives where we'll be faced with things that seem like that will break us, that will grind us down, but we can pull through it. When God is in our corner, we can honestly say that we did it by the grace of God. Joshua trusted in God from the beginning. I know his faithfulness is an inspiration to me. In fact, in Joshua 1.9, that was what I refer to as my life verse. That was the, one of the first verses I ever memorized. And I lean on it heavily to this day whenever I'm faced with troubles or when I'm faced with anything that I go up against. I rely on that verse and I trust that verse and I say it to myself over and over again. So when... I had the information sent to us when we laid this out about me being here to be able to give this message today. And I saw what verses I was going to be speaking on. I was like, man, this is awesome. I got this. This is, this is my verse. This is my jam. I, I got this. 
I'm going to knock this one out the park. But God had a different story. Okay, I was confident in myself that I was going to be able to do this. I wasn't relying on God. So he twisted it up a little bit. I found out that this was probably one of the hardest messages I ever had to write because I had to trust in what I was reading. I had to believe what God said and that I had to base my confidence on that he would see me through. It wasn't confidence in myself. It was the confidence in him. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, that whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God gave me this message as a testimony because you can't have a testimony before having a test. God gave Joshua two million Israelites and a river to cross and a test of faith as a testimony. And in the end, he gave a future generations a memorial to reflect upon what took place because of that. Now, you see, all too often we want to build memorials to ourselves of past problems, issues that are useless to us, and they become idols more than they become memorials. And maybe there are broken relationships, failed friendships, debt, or even just general problems of life that we want to build up and make it worse than what they truly are. And they become a stumbling block that we aren't able to get past. Or maybe they even become a tomb that when we look at them or we think of them, a part of us dies. And it's all because we tried to do it alone without trusting in God. Or we didn't think that he was in our corner. And, he, and that we were alone throughout that. But God was there. So when you see those, and those instead of looking at those as stumbling blocks, look at them as memorials. We have to understand that God puts things in our way to make us stronger. God had the Israelites take rocks out of the middle of the Jordan River to build a memorial, the middle of what could have been what held them back from entering the promised land, essentially the middle of their problem. Isn't that where we usually cry out to God when we're in the middle of our problems? Let him use something from the middle of that problem to give you a memorial. Let him give you a memorial of how good he is. Don't let that become a stumbling block. Let it become a memorial. If it becomes a stumbling block, you may never get past it. God is building you a memorial. What is it going to be? I know for me, he's building me one. And I'm confident in him that I know that it's throughout everything that happened in my life. It all started back, I was 13. I was in a car accident involving a bicycle. I was hit on my bike where I was laid up in the hospital for a couple weeks. I found myself praying. I'm not sure who I was praying to. Praying to God in my mind, but I didn't know who that God was. But I did it anyway. Or it might have been a marriage that fell apart where I was praying for it to be saved. Praying to the same God that I didn't know when I had my accident. The same God that I didn't have a relationship with. Or maybe it was getting remarried to a wonderful woman. A woman that brought me to know the Lord and actually understand his greatness and his awesomeness and how he can work in us. Or maybe it was having a child at 36 when I, I never thought I would have children at that point. But I did. And I never regret it. And it's the greatest thing, that one of the greatest blessings that God has ever given me. Or how about maybe going back to school at age 42 going back for Christian ministry, something I never thought I would, but God led me on that path. Or maybe it was leaving a job that I worked at for 17 years where I was comfortable, 
I could have, you know, stayed there. But instead, I pursued ministry. And God brought me here. And that's where I'm at here today before you. And I was able to be here because of that. Now, these are all monuments that God has put in my life. These are all memorials that he's built for me. And because of them, I know I can stay stronger in God. Now, those of you that know what I'm talking about and have that comfort to know that the things that are there are memorials, not stumbling blocks. God builds them for us. Just as he built one for the Israelites in the Jordan River, he builds them for us every day. And those of you who trust in God understand this. But those of you who do not understand this, that don't know that, that look at those as stumbling blocks or tombs, you can change that. You can change those stumbling blocks into monuments, those idols or those tombs into memorials by having a relationship with God. You may not know what that means, but you can. It's not hard. He wants you. He's there waiting for you. He created us. He's with us. He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. And you just have to ask for it and come to him. Now, he developed that and he came up with that to have a relationship with us. And he wants you. And the only thing that is stopping that is our sin. That sin that we have separates us from that. And there's nothing we can physically do to be able to remove that from our life. But there is something that you can do. And that's believe that Christ died for you. Christ died for our sins. And because of him dying on the cross, being buried and rising again three days later, we have that hope. We have that faith to know that because of that, we can have that life with him and that relationship with him. Now, you may not realize or you might think like, well, okay, well, maybe I do believe that. But no, it's not the case. It's either you believe that Christ died for you and took your sins away or you don't. Okay? You can do this today. And that when you do accept Christ and all that he's done, that life starts now. It doesn't start when you die. It doesn't start three days from now. It starts now. And all you have to do is accept him into your life. And you, so. Father God, I thank you for blessing us with this day. I thank you, Lord, for providing us with this time this morning. And I just pray, Lord, that, that you've reached someone, you've touched someone's heart that may not know you, Lord. And I just, I pray for those who are building up stumbling blocks and not memorials, Lord. And I just, I pray for those that they may understand that these things are in our lives to strengthen us, to build us, to grow us, and that you are there in our corner every day of our life. Lord, and I just pray that you reach out and that everybody can feel you. And I pray for those that have curious questions about that, you just ask. Say, God, I know that Christ died for me. I know that he took my sins. I know that he died for me. And Lord, I just, I pray for each and every person that's watching this today, the troubles that you may have, to know that God's in your corner and be strengthened with that knowledge. I pray this.
some good news for you. We are, uh, we want to begin to unroll or unravel our plan to start gathering again. And, and so many of you have probably begun to see over the last month or so a number of churches, in the, especially in the Midwest and the South, starting to open. And, and uh, next Sunday, you're going to see a lot of the churches to the west of us, to the west of us, starting to open. And, and that's, we're not ready for that next week yet. But let me, let me kind of walk you through the next three weeks. So next week, Memorial Day weekend on, on May 24th, that's Sunday, we're going to continue live stream only, but we're going to celebrate communion together. And it'll look like we did on Good Friday, if you were with us on Good Friday, where I'll, I'll, I'll lead us here, but, but in your homes, if you want to be for the service, whatever service you're going to be a part of to, to prepare yourself within your families to, to have communion, and you can maybe have some bread and some grape juice. I, on Good Friday, I've heard, I heard everything from... We prepared in advance and, and baked unleavened bread, which is amazing and crazy, uh, to all we had was goldfish and Gatorade. And I think that's fine, too, and God honors that. And so that'll be next Sunday. And then May 31st is, uh, May 31st is, is Pentecost Sunday. And I, I feel like, especially with us not being able to, to do, I mean, we, we did live stream, but especially with the way Easter wasn't a gathering or whatever, I, I feel like maybe now more than ever, we need to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to, I'm not going to talk much about it this week, but next week we'll kind of begin to unravel. We're going to do something to celebrate, have an extra celebration for the, for the Sunday, the day of Pentecost. And so I want you to stay tuned for that. But let me talk about June 7th. Uh, Sunday, June 7th is the, the first Sunday that we're going to begin to have gatherings back here in the building. 
And um, that's one of the great things that has happened over this time is while we've all been having to social distance from each other, a lot of the churches in our valley here have been, been communicating and connecting and coordinating, I think more so than I can ever remember in my time, time down here. And, and uh, that's been great. And one of the things that we've been praying together about and talking about and discussing is, well, let's, uh, have, let's get a lot of us to, to kind of open at the same time and, and be unified and move forward in that. And so uh, that's, that's what we're going to do. So Sunday, June 7th, a lot of the churches in our area here, us and Hopewell and High Point and East Nant Mill and Abundant Living and some other ones, uh, we're all going to open at the same time. And so that's, that's going to be Sunday, June 7th. And one of the questions that, that we'll, you know, go through some of the questions that we're going to get, and, and let me just say before kind of I walk through them, uh, we'll have a, a full written statement and communication, things like that at the end of this week. I just want to walk you through some of maybe the more common questions, and so I don't get 10,000 emails. Please don't email me about this this week. I, I, it, it's, it'll be overwhelming. Just allow us to kind of get some things out in writing, and we'll do that. But let me answer some of the, the more common questions that I know we're going to get. Number one. Should everybody come back on June 7th? No. No. And, and let, me, let me make it really clear. It is perfectly okay to not attend in-person services right away. I'm going to say it again. It is perfectly okay for you to not attend in-person services okay. Do not, do not think that you're, uh, don't, don't feel guilty about that. Don't feel like you're lacking faith because of that. That's, that's, I mean, that's not what, what's happening. You have to make the right decision for you and your family. And different people are in different circumstances and different situations, and you have to make that right decision. And so not everybody should come back. We just want to have an option for those who, who, who are ready and desiring to get together with their church family to be able to, to gather again. And, 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 and let me just say, obviously, um, obviously, if you're not feeling well or you're running a fever, that isn't just for this season. Can I just say, like, 10 years from now, I'm going to be saying this as well. Don't come that Sunday, okay? Can you just, just stay home and, 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 wa and watch the service and worship with us that way? And so kind of along with that, people will say, well, are you still going to do the live stream? We did the live stream before this. We're going to continue doing it. In fact, it's been amazing how many doors God has opened up <clears throat> through live streaming that, that we had never seen before. It's been Amazing how many of you guys have been inviting people through the live stream, and they've been tuning in, and people getting saved, and we, we've been figuring out how to do um, uh, social distancing baptisms, which we, we now think we have underway, and we're going we're gonna to get started with, and so it's been kind of cool to, to see that. So obviously, we're still going to be streaming the services we did before this. We're going to do that after, so uh, that's, that's not an issue. Uh, here's the two questions I think that are most on people's minds. Number one is, are churches actually allowed to meet? Like, are you guys all just going rogue, or what? We, are, are they actually allowed to meet? And, and here's the thing. We were always allowed to meet. We, there was never a time when we weren't allowed to meet. If you, if you go back to the time where we made the decision, we put out the initial video to, to close the building, we actually uh, closed the building before the stay-at-home orders happened. Uh, that, that was a decision that churches voluntarily made to, to close their sites for a period of time. And, and I, I don't know that, that we any of us thought that it would be for three months like it's going to be, but, but we, we voluntarily decided to do that because we felt like it was the right thing, it was the best way for us to love our neighbors in that season. But the church, and rightly so, the church has always been in the essential category. And I'll tell you what, I, I, I've been, we've been seeing it and hearing it, and probably you have been as well, that, that the ramifications of this virus, and, and listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't have been social distancing. We we should have, and we we have been, and we still will do that, that, that and all that. But the ramifications that this virus has, and will, I think, for a long time have, on not just people's bodies, but on their souls, is becoming breathtaking. Uh, and the the it's just it's it's uh, depression and marital issues, and abuse, and financial strains, and the inability to grieve loved ones, and huge, huge, huge spikes in addiction, and, and suicide, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they, are, they are and, all, and will continue, I think, for a, a while to explode 
and, and people need help. And the answer is and always will be Jesus Christ and the church of Jesus Christ. And so, so our local representatives and, and attorneys from the PA Family Institute and the governor himself a, a number of times has verified that churches can meet and, and, and being able to meet with people and, and worship together and minister to each other is important for, for our well-being and our, I think our community well-being and our community health and our community stability, especially in times like this. So here's the last thing I'm going to address, and then, like I said, we'll put out more as, as the weeks go on or as this week goes on. And, and uh, don't email me 10,000 emails about this. We're going to put things out on social media, and, and we'll email you, and, and we'll, we'll, do, we'll talk more next Sunday and things like that. But here's the last one. Will things go right back to normal? <clears throat> um, no. They, they, the services will not look like they did on March 8th. That's actually the last time. We, we met two and two plus months ago. Um, we're going to have to roll this out in phases, and we're going to ask for your cooperation to help us roll this out in phases. And, and, and there's going to be some social distancing guidelines that we've been asked to follow, and we're going to try to meet those. Like in phase one, which is we're going to roll out starting June 7th, phase one, we will not have children's ministry yet. We're going to ask you to bring your kids into the auditorium with you. And in phase one, we will not have the cafe open. We will not have food out there. In phase one, we're going to try to provide a touchless um, experience. And what I mean by that is we're going, to, we're going to have it so that you won't have to touch doorknobs or we won't pass an offering plate. We have the things, the, uh, the, the bins in the back that will be open that you can put it in. And, and we're not going to hand out bulletins yet. Our bulletins have always been online. You continue to get them online, things like that. So we're going to try to provide a, a touchless experience for you. Um, we're, going to be, we're going to be adding services here in the beginning, even though uh, less, not everybody's going to come back, we're still going to add services because we want to spread more people out and give, you know, and, and um, be able to, to do that in smaller, uh, use our entire venue to kind of, the entire auditorium to spread people out. And, and so we're going to be taking steps and we're going to ask you to, to take steps with us and be willing to, to take those steps so we can continue to, to try to, 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 to love people body, soul, and spirit body, soul, and spirit. So, like I said, we'll have more of an explanation. We'll roll this out um, as the week goes on. But I, I, I'm hoping that just by us kind of announcing this, by giving you a date to shoot for, giving you some, some things to look forward to as we move forward, I'm, I'm hoping that that gives you even more hope moving forward. I know it does for me. It, it's very, I, 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 we, we really missed having the people. <laughs> and I, and even me, who's probably might be the biggest introvert in the entire church, even I was, we, need, we needed some people, right? And so um, we're hoping that this gives you hope, and we're excited, we're really excited to, to begin to be able to move forward, okay? So let's, um, let's close on this uh, with, um, with worshiping the God who we never stop worshiping during this time, but who has, has done some amazing things in these months, and I think even more so in the months to come. I know a place where we can go Troubles down in your soul I know a place where mercy flows Take the stains, make you out of them show Like a tide that Rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes it come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Oh, 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 we're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Hey, hey, let's get washed by the water, washed by the water. And right
Thanks, MCC, for joining us this Sunday. God bless you. We will see you soon.